So in terms of mass surgery, we have the only program in Toronto is here at Women's College Hospital. Um, with the only other program, someone just started um, part-time in Ottawa, but other than that, there's no other center in, in Ontario. So we get patients from up north, come for uh, eight-hour drives, or fly in. Um, and in Canada, there's, there's um, about eight programs uh, across the country. So we, we do about 3,000 cases per year. Uh, you know, there are certainly many more eligible cases, but our wait list has gone up to four months now, which is excessive by any, by any measure. Um, so there are more than 3,000 that technically should probably get most surgery, but that don't because of the wait time. Um, we specialize only on the head and neck. So if it's on the back, you know, we're, we're at capacity and we focus on the highest risk sites where the skin is most valuable. We, because we remove the tumor in stages, uh, like you saw, we're able to spare as much normal skin as possible, which means that the scars will be smaller. Um, we're checking 100% of the edges of the pie shell, uh, all around it and underneath it, so that uh, we have the highest cure rates. Traditionally, with a two-week slow test, they only check less than 5% of the edges. They kind of just take some samples uh, and see if there's tumor at the edges. But uh, you can imagine you're checking less than 5% and you're missing um, some tumor cells. Uh, this is an important issue. We're able to, because we're able to do the tumor removal and then we reconstruct, um, fix the hole that we made, um, on the same day, the patient has, you know, it's convenient for them. Everything's done that same day. Um, you know, I just had a patient last week who, we, start, we started at 8 a.m. and an, uh, it was a longer case and I didn't finish till um, 5 p.m. and I felt bad because they're, they're waiting there for an hour each time we tested. And so, you know, I would say, you know, sorry, you know, thanks for your patience. It's, I know it's been a really long day, but I said, you know what, like, the, the alternative, this is way better. Well, first of all, I brought a lot of reading, but this is way better than um, the alternative where he said, you know, actually, I had another skin cancer five years ago. And they had, to, they had to keep bringing me back every few weeks because they couldn't get it uh, uh, the first two times. And so this is, he was like, you know, I'd rather just get it all done uh, in a single day. And the other thing is, um, as the most surgeon, we're kind of, we serve as kind of a surgeon, the pathologist reading the slides under the microscope, and the dermatologist who has expertise in kind of seeing and diagnosing uh, skin lesions, um, all as one person, whereas traditionally, you know, in the slow test, they go to a lab where a different pathologist would read it. And, or you send it to a surgeon who doesn't necessarily have expertise in skin lesions. They may be, you know, removing hands or something. Um, and so we have integrated everyone, uh, every role into a single person. And this is not only efficient, but it does provide continuity of care. And in the end, it does save healthcare dollars because we're not paying three different doctors um, to treat one tumor. So just to go back to the case, so the tumor was that big, and after, so the defect size was surprising to everyone, um, but we did, I won't show you all the stitching, but it, uh, this is after stitching them up two months later, so the, a, a decent cosmetic result was fixing up the size of the hole that, that was there. So I'm gonna uh, finish off just with um, three uh, basic tips for skin health. Um, the, uh, some of you may already do this, but um, these, uh, these are things that um, have evidence to support them and, and then actually do, do something. So one thing is uh, to make sure your skin doesn't get dry. You know, dryness leads to a lot of problems. And when it can lead to eczema, it makes you more sensitive to allergies. Um, winter is the worst time because our heaters are on. So if you can get a humidifier, that's great. Um, I like hot showers, but we're not supposed to do hot showers. So, and if we do, keep them as short as possible. So ideally, warm, uh, tepid water is better. Um, eat milder on the skin. Um, soaps that have built-in uh, moisturizers are good. Um, harsh soaps are the ones that have uh, that are antibacterial, um, which isn't usually necessary um, unless you have uh, chronic, like recurrent infections or anything. But um, And then, uh, if you do need to moisturize, and you, you'll notice if you come out of a shower and you don't moisturize, and within 20 minutes you, your skin feels tight and dry, um, then it does need to be put on right as soon as you step out. So step out of the shower or bath, pat dry, but 
before the water evaporates, the moisturizer has to go on to lock in the moisture. Otherwise, um, your skin will be drier than, than it started with. Um, if you have uh, oily skin to begin with, then you don't need to moisturize. But. Uh, the other, the other um, recommendation is to become familiar with your own skin. And, you know, it's, it's always amazing. Uh, I, you know, patients come in kind of two categories. There is ones you know every you know centimeter of their skin, and I, I'm I'm surprised, but it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and it's impressive. Um, and then there are those who have no clue about you know what their nose looks like or their I don't know their hand or anything, right? And so you know it's it's good to uh, examine your own skin. You know, if, if patients are at high risk of skin cancer or they've had skin cancers, I recommend it every month. But um, if you if you haven't, then you know every couple two or three months would, would be fine. If you look at your skin every day, you won't notice small changes, so we don't advise uh, daily. But it's important to look at areas that you wouldn't normally see. So you do need a handheld mirror and a, the bathroom mirror or someone else at home who could look at your back and other areas. Um, under under the feet, you know, between the toes. Those are where um, cancers, if they do develop, and it is uncommon, but if they do develop, they often, the diagnosis is delayed for a long time because no one looks there. And so the prognosis is often uh, much worse for those areas. Um, and so I do recommend making it a formal point to, to look at your own skin regularly. Uh, you know, one, one thing I've learned um, over the years is that you know, listening to patients and what they notice is, is important. And it's easy for us to, dis so to dismiss things because uh, when we look at lesions, often it's a pretty, it's like recognizing your family member. You, you, you see you right away often, right? And so we say, you know, that, no, it's, don't worry about that lesion, it's not a problem. But then I say, well, you know what, I just, something bothers me about it, I just want it off, um, just take it off, or, or, or I'm sure it's changed a little bit. Um, and we've all, as dermatologists, we've all had instances where, like, you know, you know what, it's definitely nothing. If you want to do it for cosmetic reasons, fine. Or, or like, just because it bothers you, fine, I'll just take it, biopsy it or, or take it off, and it comes back as melanoma or something. And so we're all, uh, we've all been fooled. And so that's where, you know, your role can come in to, uh, in terms of becoming familiar with your own skin and uh, newer changing skin lesions. Th things that we're really looking for uh, in terms of brown spots or dark spots are, are signs of melanoma. So we talk about the ABCDEs. I hope that everyone will be able to recognize that that it, just on, uh, on space value looks ugly and, and abnormal, but it's not, it, in most cases aren't that clear cut, but you can see for, in terms of area or for asymmetry, so one half is clearly different from the other. You can't draw a line and have two equal um, sides. Um, the border is irregular. There's more than one color. They have you know, dark blue, brown, Red. Um, the diameter, this is probably the least useful thing, but diameter greater than the tip of a pencil eraser, so six millimeters. You know, there are small lesions can, that can be problematic, but that is included in, in the guidelines. And uh, the important uh, feature of E refers to changing or evolving lesions. So if you notice all of a sudden something's getting a lot bigger or it's changing color um, or there's a little branch growing out from it, um, then those are signs that it should be checked out by, by a physician. And what's the most important uh, skin health tip that I'm going to talk about? <laughs> All right, good. Well, then I don't have to. So sun protection. So this is not good. And this is, the skin doesn't lie. That's, that's what I always tell patients when you, I, I, my transplant patients, I was like, so how's, your, how's the sun protective practice? And they're like, oh, that's great. I, and then you look at this, and then I say, no, you, something's, really, something's not working because uh, you have clearly very tan. That's your background skin color, and that's, that's your tan. And, and there are a lot of reasons for, for protecting, protecting yourself from the sun. It leads to um, sunburn, sun tan, and premature aging. So this is what we don't want. So, you know, we try to get across the skin cancer message, but for young people, sometimes that doesn't get across. But aging sometimes hits home, closer to home. But the classic change is, you know, you get leathery skin, wrinkly, loss of elasticity, loss of tissue support, so it's kind of sags and bunches up. But this... Um, this is obviously an extreme case, um, but at least it's uh, premature aging. It, it's, resp it's responsible for most of the aging changes. You look at people who have darker skin pigment um, naturally, um, they, they age much better in terms of their, their skin because they have the natural protection from the sun. You know, you get a lot of the skin freckling from sun freckles. You can see it's accentuated in the kind of V-line area of the collar. Uh, this was a 
I didn't anonymize this because it's, it's published in a medical journal, um, is in the New England Journal of Medicine as a case. And um, oh, it's very interesting. So look at the right ha half of the face versus the left. And so that's all sun damage. That's uh, all the wrinkling and everything. And look at the other side. And guess what this person's occupation was? Driver. They were truck drivers. So they, they would roll down the window and get all their sun on the left side of their face over many decades. And that you can, like, that's as clear cut as you can get with um, illustrating the, the sun damage uh, that can arise. Um, so what do we mean by daily sun protection? Um, or finally, what the kid does, so sunscreen um, daily for, you know, the water moisturizer that have SPF in them now. I recommend um, number 30 SPF is fine. I mean, if you are going to be out for hours, like for golf, so then it's important to reapply every two hours, which is what a lot of people forget. They put it on, they may remember to put it on 20 minutes before they go out, but then they don't reapply after seeing out all day. And, um, basically, if you get a tan, you know that um, some UV rays have gotten through. Um, the other thing is covering up. Now, um, th I've taken just a, a photo of, uh, of some sun protective clothing. Now, this uh, is probably not as sun protective, but those ones, you know, long sleeves, um, there is a, like the SPF refers to the number for sunscreen, there's a UPF, which refers to the sun protective ability for clothes. And so you can get clothes that have a UPF protection factor. Um, you know, surfers, a lot of the rash guards, you know, surfers don't go shirtless really anymore. Um, and those are all UV, UV protective. Um, and in Australia, for example, it's, you go to the beach and most kids now wear those long sleeve, they're like very light, dry fit type materials that protect um, very well from the sun. And that makes it easier than sliding on sunscreen every time you go in the water. Um, so we talked about SPF 30. You want it to be make sure it's broad spectrum. So it has to cover UVA and UVB. Um, you know, traditionally a lot of the agents only protect against UVB because we used to think that that was the cancer causing um, UV rays. But UVA um, is not only responsible for aging, but also contributes to cancer as well. Um, and then to reapply every two hours and or after getting your your skin wet or or sweating. Uh, now people ask, you know, what about if I, it's a cloudy day? Um, still, as long as it's daytime outside, meaning you can see and it's not pitch black, that means there's UV rays getting to your eyes and that it, it's, uh, it's still ex exposure. Um, and same with shade. Um, shade is better than no shade, but things still reflect off uh, the ground and everywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. In terms, of, you read so much about vitamin D and yeah. what Yeah. So I go outside and I'm all covered up and everyone says, hey, yeah. you need a little bit of sun to get your vitamin D. So yeah. what would your recommendation be? I, I understand everything that you're saying yeah. here, but yeah. vitamin D is important as well. So yeah. what amount of daily sun exposure would give you your vitamin D but not yeah. give you a, a likelihood towards uh, skin damage? Yeah. I thought it's actually coming in a few slides, but I, I just I can, address, I, can, I can address it now. Because it's uh, balanced. I think yeah. I am getting my vitamin D. But, yeah. You know. So vitamin D, um, I, I can address that now. So vitamin D, uh, first let's focus on the health benefits of vitamin D. So it's been clearly shown that it benefits bones. For, it's good for bone health. Um, the association with cancer that um, has you know, gotten a lot of press is, if you look at the evidence, is still unclear. Um, so it may help with cancer. Uh, but the bottom line is vitamin D, it plays an important role in some part of your health. So the question is, how is the best way to get it? And we know that you can get vitamin D through your diet, so d through a lot of uh, fish and seafood, through supplement, orange juice is supplemented with it, and with dairy, and, or through vitamins. So, and those sources are just as good as getting sun exposure. So if you're getting a source that's not also increasing your risk of cancer, then that's uh, much better. And that's, the recommend that's our recommendation. Um, if, they, if they found that smoking would, was good for your bones or something, no one would recommend that you go smoke because you'll increase your chance of lung cancer. So I, I think there is no safe limit on UV exposure. Uh, um, I think it's, you may read you know, a certain number of minutes, but there's no evidence to support you know that at this cutoff, you're good for your vitamin D, but not you're not going to change your skin cancer risk. Um, so, so try to get it from another source. Then. Yeah, it's not necessary to get it from sun. And, and you mentioned um, fish oils. Did you say like a 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would, um, so fish and seafood, um, dairy are common sources, and orange juice. If you if you just search on the internet, uh, through, uh, uh, like a, you'll get probably a, a dietitian site with a list, they're, um, they're, they'll have a, a detailed list. But they and they actually often list how much vitamin D you'll get from each source. Uh, but even if you don't eat those foods, taking a vitamin, they're not that expensive either, which is good. Um, and you can easily take supplements. For children, they have the liquid form. Um, just make sure you, you, you follow the recommended dosage. I mean, there's quite a, there's quite a safe zone of a range, but don't go over what they say the matter should be. But, so, you know, what would be, you know, it's helpful for bones. Um, I'm sure if it's helpful for cancer, but it won't do you harm if you, as long as you don't go over the maximum dose. So you, you might as well take it. And it's the big rage right now, so. <laughs> uh, just a little bit of history for me. My grandmother had basal cell cancer. My mom had basal cell and has done, done most. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have malignant melanoma. So are you going to talk about hereditary and genetics? Um, I, I wasn't going to, um, but I think... So genetics uh, play a role in, uh, I'll briefly address it, genetics play a role in any disease really, and in cancer in particular, we know there's always a genetic component and then there's an environmental component. So for skin cancer, the environmental component is really mainly sun, there are other things, but mainly sun. Um, for for non-melanoma skin cancer, like basal cell, the, the genetic component is, no, is, not, is not clear in that, you know, it's not a direct thing where, you know, your, your parents have it, then you'll have like a double the risk. It's, I mean, I think by nature you're inheriting their skin type, you know, all the risk factors that go along with sensitivity to the sun. So it's hard to tease out whether, you know, it's the gene that is specific to the cancer or if it's the gene that's making you have fair skin and blonde hair. So um, um, genetics is not as important for skin cancer. And, cl and for melanoma as well, there has not been a specific gene that's been strongly linked. So at our best, um, the, there's a genetic test that's available for melanoma, but it's only recommended if you have you've had two melanomas yourself, or two of your relatives, uh, first degree relatives have had, have had melanoma. So that takes over a lot of people already. But even in those patients, when they get a test, only a quarter have this gene. So we still don't know the specific genes that well. So it, it's, I think the main thing is to focus on the, the preventative factors and modifying sun exposure. Well, I one minute, just a quick comment yeah. before you have to continue. I have been going to a dermatologist since I was 16. Yeah. Nobody has ever said, um, with the dry skin, nobody's ever yeah. said, and I, that horrifies me that I think I, that could be, it's something I do anyway, yeah. but nobody's ever mentioned it. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, uh, it, it's, it's, the dry skin issue is, I mean, it's not really cancer, which is fortunate, oh. but it's, yeah, it's obviously comfort and keeping your skin it's nice. It's yeah. prevention, yeah. but I just, I just find it interesting nobody ever said that to me. Yeah. yeah. So. Clothing we talked about, so covering up is useful, it's easier than mm -hmm. um, sunscreen even. And then um, avoiding peak sun periods uh, in midday. Um, so going to the vitamin D side, uh, so it annoys me. This is one tanning salon that I have to walk by sometimes. So <laughs> going south, go over a protective base tan before you leave. A tan is a natural sunscreen that doesn't wear off. Um, and then I walked by another way and took another photo. So did you know that sunbed users have the highest vitamin D levels in Canada? More than supplement users. A single sunbed session produces up to 20,000 units of vitamin D. Soak up some vitamin D, sunshine vitamin. This message is, is rampant. It's a billion dollar industry. People still go, even though I think most people un understand the risk, but maybe they, 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 they feel that it's safe based on these types of messages. Um, but you know, a single sunbed session le leads to almost doubling of your melanoma risk. There, uh, the 73 quarters of uh, tanning salon users are Caucasian females under the age of 30. Um, so this is going to be a huge, I, mean, I mentioned the epidemic at the beginning, we have a whole cohort of young women using these tanning salons who are going to, when we get older, are going to start getting uh, skin cancers. Um, so this is a problem, and you know, this would be illegal in a lot of states. Um, it's not illegal in other states or in parts of Canada. Uh, Eve is, uh, Ontario just passed legislation for minors not being allowed to go, finally. Um, but they've done, you know, those undercover studies in the U.S. where, you know, they send in a minor and they're not checked for ID or anything. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, 
it, it's surprising that this is still such a strong industry, but um, I guess people want a tannin. I guess they believe that it, it's safe, but there is no such thing as a safe tannin or a safe uh, sunbed exposure. Can I ask a question? Sure. What about the, the tans that you buy in a bottle? Are they yeah, safe? Yeah, those are... Yeah. Is that stuff actually? Yeah, those are fine. I mean, they've improved a lot. They used to make you look like a Simpsons, but yeah. uh, they're, they're, they've improved a lot. They're, they're, they've improved a lot, and they're, they're okay. The only one, the only thing, I, I, I don't know. I, there's no proof that's necessarily dangerous, but there's those spray-on machines. Um, I, I'd be hesitant to breathe in some of the the spray on, even the spray-on sunscreens. Um, it, it's probably not a good if we're having aerosolized. Chemical, I'm um, probably not not great to do, but the creams are fine. Yeah. I heard yeah. that it's uh, carotene. Yeah, it's like from carrots. Yeah, yeah, yeah beta carotene. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've discussed some of the uh, innovative programs within the dermatology program here at Women's College Hospital um, that drives uh, optimal patient care as well as uh, research questions that we're exploring, and then uh, highlighted three tips for keeping skin healthy. The main one being um, Sun protection. So I'd be happy to answer any other other questions that you may have. How do you recommend handling the case? Yeah. So so act, so actually, keratoses are kind of precancerous uh, lesions. They're a sign of sun damage, and a small percentage of them um, can go on to develop into uh, real skin cancers. So um, we generally treat them. Some of them resolve, have been shown to resolve on their own, but we, we treat them if, if they're identified. Um, it, there are a variety of treatment. There's a whole slew of treatment options, and it really depends on individual patient characteristics. So options include um, freezing them off with a cold spray, liquid nitrogen. That gives it a frostbite. Um, to uh, various cream, chemotherapy-type creams that will um, get rid of them and prevent them to burning them off, in the extreme case, even cutting them out. But uh, I think the most common treatment is still freezing them off with a, a cold spray. But uh, and the other ones include photodynamic therapy, or this light, shining this light, that um, creates a chemical reaction that burns them off. But um, there are a lot of different ways. Um, and I think the, your physician would be able to let you know what might be the most appropriate for you, or for anyone. Question for you, and I don't know if there's any relation yet, but um, laser hair removal, which has become so kind of prominent now, everybody's doing it. Is that in any way risky? To, can it cause skin cancer? Can it exacerbate skin cancer for people that are susceptible to it, or is it like mm. perfectly safe? But it's, it, in respect to skin cancer, it's not known to be linked at all, and I, I don't, I don't believe it is. Um, but in terms of other safety issues, I mean, the, a lot of it depends on the provider. So you really want to make sure that it's someone who's qualified. I mean, I'm, I'm biased, but I would say a physician doing it, or it's someone like a dermatologist who's actually trained in skin. But the, the risks are, you know, if you, it, it, it's a type of. Um, it's a laser, right? And, and so that could burn your skin if it's not, if it's you're given too high a dose. Um, it can lead to, um, if, if it's the wrong type of laser matched to the wrong type of skin, it can lead to, you know, hyperpigmentation, so darker darkening of the area. Um, so the, I, I think burns and, and darkening um, of the area are probably the, the biggest uh, risks, but not related to skin cancer. But overall, it's, if it's done properly, it's, it's, it's very safe and, and effective for usually for darker hair colors. Would you say that the laser treatment is the same for every that you can treat rosacea? Um, with, could the effects be the same, like you said, a darkening of the area and um, some of the side effects? Could that also come from laser treatment for rosacea? It could. So it's a different type of laser that's used for so rosacea leads, uh, it's, uh, you get recurrent flushing, but then it can lead to, per lead to permanent redness of, on the face or the cheeks. I think Bill Clinton um, had rosacea, which is why he was allergic to alcohol, because that makes it worse. But um, the, So laser is one of the only treatments that works for the, the redness part. And um, again, the same caveats apply. 
you know, it's very safe if it's, if it's done well. It does lead to more, um, because you're going deeper and it's a different type of laser, it does lead to more bruising and so on. But those are temporary. Um, but again, if it's misused, you can still get, you can get burns as well, you know, you can get, in the worst case, scarring, uh, darkening. Um, so, it, it, yeah, it, it is a, it's not, it's not a kind of a very simple basic device to use. It does require trained personnel. But it, it is effective. It's one of the more effective laser treatments actually used for redness. We've got time maybe for one more question if there are any. I'm just curious about keloid scarring. If, if somebody keloid scars in one area, does that mean their skin is different other places as well? Yeah, I get a lot of patients, especially before surgery, you know, they say, oh, you have to be very careful with me because I have a keloid scar. And then you look at it and it's actually not a keloid. So I think the first thing is to make sure it is a keloid. Um, and if you do have one, um, you are at higher risk um, of getting it elsewhere. But we, we do have a lot of patients who have it in the high risk locations, but if you do surgery somewhere else, they don't necessarily get one. So, for example, ear lobes or ears are very uh, common because people get piercings. Um, and then I had a patient two weeks ago who had been getting piercings for you know over 10 years and then just on the last one got a keloid. Um, so it does vary. Um, but I think, also oh, a keloid is a big, uh, it's an over scarring. So when you, um, you know, often it's from a piercing. Um, it can be from a surgery scar where you're, instead of a nice thin line along the scar, you, it, it's exaggerated and spreads beyond the scar and is raised and goes wider. Um, and it can be very symptomatic and debilitating in terms of you know painful itchiness. And at the most extreme, and this there is a this is patients with a definitely a predisposition, even with um, little things like a pimple or an ingrown hair, um, any little minor damage leads to this giant keloid. And, you know, it's, it, it's very distressing. I mean, you see like patients uh, on their chest, they have just these big lumps of scar um, from like ingrown hairs or something and, or a pimple. And it's, it's quite distressing and can be challenging to treat. But um, in those patients, for sure, it's, it's a predisposition. But in others, it can just be an isolated um, one time thing, depending on what was the cause of it. Great. All right. Thanks, Thank Thanks,